welcome us in a completely different relationship to the one we usually <laughs> have, even as with my son. Thank and you for having me. <laughs> that is a pleasure. And this is all about change. So we're going to talk about the huge change that you made exactly a year ago now. Yeah, one year anniversary, absolutely. So when you were little, what did you dream about being? Goodness, not a personal financial <laughs> advisor, I'm afraid. Um, I suppose I dreamt about telling stories, and I still, I still do in many ways. Um, telling stories like what? I couldn't tell you. I, I could tell you the story when I was little, but I couldn't tell you in what context I was planning on telling it. Um, they, they just manifested in my mind. So I suppose the most obvious channel to go into was something visual, because the stories were always quite visual. And in your capacity as my mother, you know the story, but, but for the rest of the world, I think the path from there was what is the best way to tell these stories? Understand narrative, understand script, etc. So I studied drama and went very far in that field. And, and then I had all of that kind of theoretical knowledge and practical knowledge of narrative and of acting. But I didn't know how to handle a camera or switch on a light. So then I went into production, which is where you learn all those things, above and beyond making coffee and running around. And television production. Television production, yes. Uh, specifically television commercial. Did you like the television environment? I was really afraid you were going to ask me that question. <laughs> um, the, 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 the short answer is, is I loved the environment. Um, and being on set is, is fun and energizing and, and exhilarating. And I mean, you know, you get to see really amazing things and meet really cool people. But as a career um, for perhaps the, you know, the father of, of a um, family, um, I know you want grandchildren, so <laughs> um, I, I just didn't see it working for me, unfortunately. So being on set was great. It was everything that came with it that wasn't. What was it? The insecurity? The, um, did you not see a financial future? What was it that, that you didn't like? I... <sighs> or what did you want that you didn't find in that environment? I just, I just looked at people who had made it to the kind of position that I would want to be in, um, or in 20 or 30 years time, the absolute top of the food chain. And I thought to myself, you aren't as happy, or forgive me for being frank, as wealthy as I would like to be. And, and I don't think your quality of life is where I would like mine to be. And for that reason, I had to start looking at something else. Because if that's the end of your trajectory, and you don't set it right now, a five-angle degree is going to throw you out completely in 30 years. It's interesting that you looked ahead. You didn't only say, mm. what is today about? Mm. But you looked ahead and you used the lives of other people mm. as an indicator. Um, would you advise people to do that? If you, if you start feeling uncomfortable in your environment, what, are the, what boxes do you tick before you make a change? There are two things I'd, I'd consider just off the bat. Um, I used to have a poster against my bedroom wall which read, the universe makes way for those who know where they are going. So know where you're going. If all you do every morning is wake up and think about Friday or payday or the holiday, you're screwed. <laughs> you, need, you need a long-term view because then you will find the universe will make way for you or you will make way through the universe. That's the one thing. The other thing is the famous Steve Jobs thing because that's, that's quite a long-term view, this whole universe story. The short-term view is the Steve Jobs thing. If you wake up enough, enough mornings in a row, and you look at yourself in the mirror and say, do I want to do what I'm going to do today? And the answer is no, enough times, change. So how did you decide, I mean, financial advisor is like <laughs> a 180 degree switch. Um, how did you decide? How did, how did that come up? Um, I was fortunate enough to have really good parents who, who taught a little boy about budgeting and about um, I mean, my mother gave me money for school shoes once a year, and if I then lost them, I had to buy my own school <laughs> shoes, you know, that was on me. And she gave me money for stationery and money for clothing, and if I spent it on computer games and comics, then I didn't have stationery and I didn't have clothing. So from a young age, I, I understood budgeting, and, and that then took on a natural kind of progression towards how much money do I need. And that then took on a natural progression towards how much money do I need not to work. I really hate the word retire. I think it's got a lot of stigma and a lot of connotation that we can unpack. Um, but, but let's just say independence, financial freedom. 
you know, what do you need to be there? These were questions I was asking myself at 18 while sitting on the back porch. So, so it started there. I've and you had a conversation with your dad about that. Yeah, so there, there were two. Um, one was, I think I was 15 or something. We were sitting in the spur and he asked me, he's really not a car person. I still have to drag him kicking and screaming to each new car that he buys. But he asked me, what is the nicest car I could think of? And I named whatever it was, I can't remember. And then he took out his pocket calculator and about 30 seconds later he said, if I save X, I can't remember the number, every year or every month from now, by the time I'm his age I could buy that car. And that was the key to a 15-year-old mind to unlock it. And, and I just realized... The value of long-term saving. Yes. You know, money can give you stuff <laughs> then. Um, and, and, and I think that's all it had to be. Delayed gratification, you know, all the things you learn. So, so that was the one conversation. The other conversation is, while I was 18 sitting on the porch thinking about financial freedom, although I didn't know enough to call it that at the time, <laughs> my dad came home and I was in tears. Because I'd taken, do you remember those old rolls of fax paper you used to get that rolled off with the little doikis in the sides? And I'd written 100 times 1.1 equals about 37 times for 37 years and worked out how much money I'd have by the time I was in my late 50s. And it wasn't enough. And I was <laughs> in absolute tears that I was never going to get out of the rat race. You know, I was never going to be able to not have to work. And, and he came home and, and he thought it was absolutely hilarious, you know, for obvious reasons. I was, of course, <laughs> deeply insulted that he thought it was <laughs> hilarious. And then he showed me Excel. Um, and, and obviously you can take your whole 37 reams of fax paper and turn it into one equation. And then I, I was empowered. Then I could mm. start playing. And I kept playing. I mean, at Varsity, while studying drama, I was working in a bar, earning money and buying stock. Because I was sitting once a month or once a year or whatever and saying, if I buy enough of this and it escalates at that and it does this and I assume that, can I achieve financial freedom? So you asked the question earlier, you know, why this absolute about face? And that's a very long series, series of stories to say, it's a very long series of stories to say, I'd always lived both lives, the artist and the financial planner. So how did you, how did you prepare? I mean, once you decided, that this was not where I was going to, uh, where I'm going to stay. Okay, alternative is this. So then what? You had nothing. You had matric accounting. <laughs> yes, I did. Um, I'd, I'd like to take a step back, if I may, and say first what made me decide on that change. Because we've discussed that I had a past skill set, but, but not really how I got to this idea. I drew three circles in the sand, and this was also um, my father's idea. What am I good at? What do I enjoy doing? What pays well? The way he would phrase it is not what pays well, what has a high margin. Mm -hmm. So what pays well for the energy you put in? And bang. So I, I think from a change point of view, if, if you do wake up 21 days in a row and you look at yourself in the mirror and you hate what you're doing, sure, that's step one. Now what is step two? Sit down and draw three circles in the sand. And if you can hit the middle point there, it's obvious. The universe will make way for those who know where you're going. You know where you're going, go there. And then on a, on a practical level, what did you do? I had absolutely no idea. So I phoned everyone I knew who was in the industry or knew someone in the industry. And I said, can I take you to coffee? I'm looking for a job. I don't necessarily expect you to give me a job, but you might know someone. And, you know, let me sell myself to you. And I but said, wait, that was trying to find a job. Before yes. that, you would actually stay We've gone out there and, that's and acquired the skills that you didn't, the formal skills that you didn't have. That's, that's absolutely true, sorry. So I did, while still working in film production, start studying part-time. Mm -hmm. And I did my certificate in financial planning. There are a series of them. I still have to do many more, but I did kind of the basics that you need to get into the industry. So you don't just saw it, take the leap. No. You actually put some things in place. And you try and put them in place parallel to your day job so that you don't throw yourself into the void here, so that you've got something to step out onto. At the same time, um, what I would always recommend anyone do, whether you want to change your life or not, is you save. So that when you do quit your job, you're not in an absolute emergency. You've got a month or two worth of fat in the budget. My mother, um, the lady across from me, has what, uh, and this might shock your viewers somewhat, but has what she calls a fuck you fund. <laughs> 
don't say it out loud like that. I, I told that story in an interview with Graham Smith last week. <laughs> okay. And I actually said, because it comes from um, a friend that we yes. both know called David Patient. Yes. And David always says, every person should have an FU fund. <laughs> I will not use the word uh, quite so easily. Um, but that's exactly it. That it gives you that freedom. Yes. That you you you're not you're not tied. And and when you have that, I mean, you know this. But when you know there are two months worth of expenses, even if it's lean down expenses, in the bank, I have options. I I have the freedom to start looking at other employment, to go for interviews, to tell my current boss. Could be an open hand gesture or a slightly more visceral one. <laughs> um, and, and to investigate alternatives. You, th there's an intellectual thing as well as a financial thing, an emotional thing as well as a financial thing. You feel you have freedom. When you feel you have freedom, you make choices. When you don't, you, you sit in your little corner and hope. But still, what was it like when you woke up on the first of the next month and there's no income? Oh, it scared and the living. No job. <laughs> it scared the living daylights out of me. Um, there's nothing else to be said. It is scary. And then kick in all those old um, cliches, you know, when one door opens, closes, another opens, blah de blah de blah but, it, but it's scary. I think the only way you get through that is, in my case, do something about it. Because you're always going to be scared, whether you're sitting at home on the couch, you know, trying to distract yourself, or whether you're going out there and talking to people and having interviews and drinking coffee and putting yourself out there. And you got those interviews by activating a network. That mm -hmm. is very true. I was incredibly fortunate in the network I had. Um, we had some family friends in the industry. And I'd also met people, I can't recall how, while studying, while studying and working. So back to that point about parallel mm -hmm. preparation. While studying and working, I contacted people and you know, kind of cold called and said, hi, this is who I am. Again, can I take coffee with you? Take you to coffee. And so I knew people. I'd, I'd activated a network and built a network, and I was willing to put myself out there and ask. But many people stop after the, the second or the third no. Okay, so, so whether you're selling yourself, selling life insurance, <laughs> whatever the case may be, it's a numbers game. No means next. Because the law of averages says there are 5% of people, of prospective people out there, want to give you the job want to give you the opportunity. Know someone who can help you. Now, if it's 5%, you've got to talk to 20 people to get one. If you talk to 20 people and you don't get one, the chances are you're going to get two out of the next 20. So just get up off your hindquarters and talk to people, and it will happen. It has to. There was one guy who kind of led you on. You thought you had a position. It mm. would have been very good. It mm. sounded very good. And then it fell through. Mm. How does one work with that? You're young, you're inexperienced, he was much older, you had enormous um, respect for him. And it, it was an ideal position. I mean, it, it was a real disappointment. Um, so I suppose my off-the-bat response is disappointment is like fear. When it happens, you can either, your emotional state isn't going to change. You can either do something practical or not. And what I did is I, I lined up other options. Uh, kicking and screaming and very unhappy because it was the dream job. Um, but I went and spoke to people and, and pursued other avenues. And ironically, in retrospect, I'm very, very grateful I didn't get my dream okay. job. Which brings me to perhaps another pointer or another point of advice, which is um, be careful what you wish for. And when you don't get it, often you are lucky. Yeah, that's another Steve Jobs um, is it? point. Okay. Uh, no, not quite that. But he says you can only con connect the dots backward. <laughs> yes, exactly. So you don't know where, you may not know what this will lead to, you can only see what it meant. And, and to some degree, trust, the know where you are going. If, if the path along the way tends to deviate, just know where you are going, you'll get there. I spoke to a wonderful doctor in the Eastern Cape recently, and he said to me, you must point your heart in the right direction, yes, exactly. and then things will happen. Yes. So, Stepping into a brand new environment, did you feel like you were in Standard 6 again, Grade 8? So about a month ago, so 11 months into this brand new environment, one of my mentors said to me, I was made to do this. I think he actually said I was born to do this job. So my, my short answer is no. 
And the reason my answer is no is because of that parallel preparation. Mm. I had shadowed people. I'd taken leave from my day job and shadowed people in the industry. I had studied. I had had copious amounts of coffees, lunches, meals with people. I knew exactly what the game was. I knew the dangers. I knew the advantages. So when I stepped into that world, it felt familiar. Of course it felt scary. And of course you're the, the new kid on the block and, and you know, all of that. that. That goes without saying. But I knew exactly what I was in for. I had set my expectation right. Perhaps that is the key thing. Set your expectation right. And I was lucky. I had. So don't think it will happen in the first month. Don't think it will happen in the first month. Don't think it will be easy. Don't think it will be what you think it will be, necessarily. Um, my, expe my expectation was uncertainty and fear. And then I got there and, and I kind of knew most of what was going on because I'd prepared and studied and spoken to people. I was lucky. But you make <laughs> your own luck to a degree. I you think. do, you do. But you're doing very well. <laughs> um, yes, I am. So what's the secret? Because I think it's the same in almost any job. Yes, it I is. I mean, uh, sales, which is really what, what you're doing, your dad always says that's the hardest thing to do. So it is slightly different, but I think the basics are the same. It's, it's the three circles, I think. I mean, my off-the-bat response. If, if you are good at what you do and you like what you do, the fact that it pays well or has a good margin is almost beside the point because what is success? It's not money in the bank. It's getting up each morning and saying, I'm excited to do what I'm doing today. I mean, I sometimes get up, having gone to bed at midnight, getting up six hours later for a seven o'clock appointment. You've got to kind of clear your eyes and, and you know, look like a neatly suited and tired financial advisor, even though you feel tired to the bone. But I still enjoy the work. I've got to drag myself to the meeting, but then you get there and it, you turn on. So it's the three circles, I think. I think there's a fourth thing, and that is you work bloody hard. <laughs> yeah, okay, there is that. B but ironically... You, you work hard because you want to. Yeah. And, and a large part of that, I mean, I'm no expert here, but, but there are studies out there which say that when there's a direct line between remuneration or reward, so it needn't be financial, it just has to be reward. It could also be recognition, etc. And what you do, yeah. you are happy. So if you think of your standard kind of office drone, nine to five, you get the same recognition and reward whether you're there early and stay late or not. So of course you don't put in the extra hours. You're not incentivized to. But when you have a heartfelt connection to what you're doing, and the more of it you do, the better you do, then mm. you sit at the office till 11 p.m. Two of your friends also very recently made dramatic changes in their lives. Mm. The one was in marketing and doing very well at 27-ish. Mm -hmm. He's now training to be a musician full time. <laughs> um, the other one was at the JSE, mm. made very good money. Mm. And he and a friend have a startup which does social media for big companies. Yes. So they've both kind of gone out on a limb. You, to some extent, did too. Advice to other people who may be sitting there feeling, oh, I would so like to do something else, but it's too scary. Um, the metaphor which comes to mind is someone asks the, uh, the duomini. What's that in English? The priest, the minister. The priest, the, the minister. Someone asks the minister... How do you protect your home? And he says, angels on my roof and rottweilers in my backyard. <laughs> now, I would use the metaphor as follows. Angels on your roof, know where you are going. The universe makes way for you, or you make it make way for you. The rottweilers in your backyard, do the, do the legwork, do the prep. Study what it is that you want to know. Talk to people who know the industry. Set your expectations right. Save money for your FU or rainy day fund then you're, you're as armed as you could possibly be. Um, and the more of it you do, the less scary it becomes. There's going to come a point where you want to step off the boat into the abyss. Thank you very much, and good luck. Thank you very much.